stay in the sanctuary. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 40, which is where we've been in our series on the patriarchs and the matriarchs now on who? Joseph. Thank God for the one person that, that was able to give an answer. Hey, we, got, we got one intelligent person in the room. Joseph. And as we, we're going to kind of recap a little bit of uh, what we talked about on last time because I'm not going to be moving moving forward out of this particular juncture of Joseph's life, but we do want to pull out something that we did not uh, have a chance to dive into on last week. In Genesis chapter number 40, and where we're picking up at again, it's where we were last week, but for those that weren't here, just a quick recap. We know Joseph has been through a lot at this point in his life. He's been uh, betrayed by his brothers and put into slavery and captivity. If that wasn't enough, he went from, from captivity or, or as a slave to put in prison by Potiphar because he was falsely accused of trying to get with Potiphar's wife when it was vice versa. Potiphar's wife wanted Joseph, but Joseph being a righteous man, uh, abstained from committing that sin. And as a result of him being lied on, he was put into prison by his master Potiphar. Well, while he's in the prison, he comes into the acquaintance of the chief baker and the chief butler of Pharaoh. All right? We remember that? We're not lost. We're not in the maze, right? So we, we know that Joseph had this ability given by God to interpret dreams. And so as, we, as it would happen, God always being in everything, even though Joseph went from the pit, right, to prison. He's now still under the favor and the blessing of God, and we're going to see that with uh, where we pick up in today's lesson. Genesis 40 and verse 12. It says that Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. Speaking to the chief butler, the three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore you unto your place because Pharaoh had put his chief butler and his chief baker where? In prison. So he says, in, 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 a, in, a, in a few days, you shall be restored back to your rightful position, and you shall deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hands, just like it was before, after the former manner when you were his butler. But Joseph says kindly, don't forget about your boy. Think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh. Bring me out this house. Like, I know I'm, I'm the man in charge, and I've been given favor with the warden, and, but I ain't trying to be in no dungeon. I ain't trying to be in no prison. When, you, when this happens and you get back to Pharaoh, let him know my story. Think about how kind I've been to you. Mention my name. Just, just whisper it in his head. Let him know so I can get out of this place as well. He says, he gives his recap of his life. He says, for indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also have I done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, guess what? I got a dream too, because the chief butler dream went well. He says, I have a dream also, way before MLK said it. Behold, I had three white baskets on my head. This was his dream. And then he was a baker. He says, in the uppermost basket, there was of all manner of baked meats, or what we would call pastries today, for Pharaoh. And the birds did come, eat them out of the basket upon my head. Seems like a nice little dream, right? But Joseph said, this is the interpretation of your dream. The three baskets, three days as well. Yet within three days, shall Pharaoh lift up your head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree. And the birds shall eat your flesh from off thee. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. They were able to come out of the dungeon, come out of the prison, just as Joseph had, had prophesied over them. And what happened? Verse 21, he restored the chief butler to his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand just like he had did before. Verse 22 says, but he hanged the chief baker 
just as Joseph had interpreted to them. And our keystone scripture, verse 23, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Ah, hallelujah, somebody. We don't want to say hallelujah. <laughs> Yet the chief butler, when he was restored to his position after Joseph told him what was going to happen, straightened up his morale because they were troubled. I didn't read that in this session, but when we read before, they were troubled because of the dreams that were happening. And Joseph assured him, hey, dude, you're going to be all right. Three days, you're going to be out of here. But don't forget about me. And that's what I want to talk about in this session. God, don't forget about me. Amen. God, don't forget about me. I know you see the things I'm going through. I know you see the things that's happening in my life. Amen. Are you there? Are you listening? Are you still sitting on heaven's throne? Don't forget about it. And I know sometimes in church, we've been doing a series on uh, the church on Wednesday. So I want to encourage everybody, if you can't make it on Wednesdays, please come out and hear the series that we're doing on the church. Because we're talking about what the church is supposed to look like in, in our time. And, and comparing that to what we see as opposed to what the Bible ordained for it to be. And as you start peeling back the layers of what's happening in church today and looking at what the church was ordained to be, you'll see it's a drastic difference. Men are now following traditions of men. We're now doing what we want to do. We make our own rules. We make our own way of worship. We make our own commandments. That's not going to please God. But I bring that up to say it's important that we follow the script and stick to the script of what God wants. Because in doing so, that's where our spiritual growth will happen. Tradition ain't going to help you when you go out, go out these doors and face the world. Jumping and hollering and falling down and screaming all over the place ain't going to help you. But that's what we reduce church to. You have to be able to be able to be educated and get good doc, biblical doctrine. In order. What's wrong? Everybody, I'm, I'm trying to see, do I need to still be up here holding the microphone? Do we need to leave it? Because all I see is eyes looking over here. But, but anyway, we, we got to get to a point where church is back to what God intended to. Not what the black church wanted to be, not what the white church wanted to be, but what God said to do. And I know most people don't like talking like this because they ain't been called to do this. But I'm concerned because I care about God's people. Amen. And I've been a warrior since yay high for this. I didn't get born again until I was 30. But I even know at that time when I was preaching, God called me to war for his people. Amen. That's what I'm allowed to walk in now. So we got to get rid of the foolishness that is happening in these churches and start to win people for Christ for real. Amen. That's what our ministry is designed to do. That's why every time people come to church, they say, oh, this church is different. Oh, I can feel the love in this church. Amen. We don't rely on tradition to get things done. Amen. We rely on the Holy Spirit. You, and if you hang out here for any period of time, you will see that. The reason that's important is because, for the most part, the same people that go to church every day, every week, live in the church, you start examining their lives, you'll see the devil is having a butt-kicking contest with them. Oh, yeah, I, know, I, I grew up in it. I'm telling you what I know, not what I think. I'm telling you what I've experienced and what I know. There's no spiritual growth, no forgiveness, no how to, don't nobody know how to walk in love. It, it's not there. We're mentally clocked out. We're depressed. Our families are broken up. But we go on church on Sunday. God is good, y'all. No, that's not what church is for. We're supposed to be growing. You're supposed to be able to look at, look back on the past year of life and say, "Man, I started here, and God has brought me all the way to this point." That's what church is for. I'm not making that up. That's what Jesus said when He said the Scripture He gave gifts unto me, and why? For the perfecting of the saints, so that His church can be uplifted, not to still be in dry ground. We gotta be fruitful. We got to multiply. That's what God has called us to do. I just want to throw that commercial out there for Wednesday night Bible study. But this is important because as we see with Joseph's life, just because God gave him these dreams and visions, that does not mean his life was all hunky-dory and everything was just so good. That's the point I'm making. And so we got to know this and encourage one another as believers, right? Just because we belong to Christ does not mean our life is going to be apple pie every single day. It's going to be some heartbreak. It's going to be some pain. It's going to be some heartache. It's going to be some times we don't know what to do. It's going to be some times when we say, well, Lord, why? Why, why am I going through this? Why, why is this happening? Joseph didn't sin against God. Joseph didn't do anything wrong, but he was still in the pit. Amen. If that wasn't enough, he went to the prison. Right? If that wasn't enough, he was in slavery. 
but he was a righteous man. See, so just because we sometimes fall into what we would call these uncomfortable situations does not mean God has forgotten about us. It just means he's getting us to a certain place. We, I don't want to, you know, skip ahead in the story, but later on we'll see why Joseph had to go through what he had to go through. And it represented not only his salvation, but the salvation of the whole world. The, the salvation of the whole world was in his palm. And that's what we got to recognize when we go through. It's not a time to curse God. It's not a time to doubt God. It's a time to cling even more to the Lord. <laughs> cling even more to the Lord. Because he's taking us somewhere, y'all. And we got to encourage one another with these words so that we'll be encouraged. This past week, I had a situation, got a phone call, and, I, and, and before I knew it, I was starting to, I could feel the stress level building up. And I said, Lord, I can't do nothing about this. Why am I stressing out? Amen. See, that the enemy will use things against us. One of the things we'll have to understand about God, we can't control nothing. He's in control. That's why he's God. That's why we call him God. He's in complete sovereign control. And when we, our hardest problem is getting out the way. That's all we got to do. We stress out because we want to we wanna control the situation. We, oh, Lord, I, I need to do this or I can just be there and do it. No, I can't do nothing. But God can. The, the same God. That delivered us before, he ain't slumbering and sleeping. He's still right there. He's going to deliver us again. Amen. So even in Joseph's situation, he never let his morale slip and dip to the point where he no longer trusted God. Amen. He had the, this youthful exuberance of loving God and loving people. And just because he was sold into slavery or in the pit or in the jail, he didn't allow that to make him turn his back on God. And that's what we have to keep in mind when we're going through the trials and tribulations of life. We go through, Lord. I, sometimes we just got to cry out. We're not going to always understand it. We may say, Lord, don't forget about your boy. Don't forget about me, Lord. I'm, I'm struggling down here. I need you right now. Help me. Deliver me, Lord. Psalm 13. Psalm number 13. If anybody can relate to the Lord, don't forget about me. We know it's King David, right? <laughs> Psalm number 13, I'm going to read it in its entirety. Listen to what David says in verse 1. How long will you forget me, O Lord? Forever. How long will you hide your face from me? I know me and David, the only ones that ever questioned God, and said, Lord, will you forget about me? I know y'all deep, y'all been spiritual all y'all life. Y'all ain't never said, Lord, why y'all, the Lord been by your side all the time. I know. So I'll talk for me and David. But yeah, sometimes as we go through life, we're going to feel moments where it seems like God is nowhere near our vicinity. It, it, and it's not because God is trying to, to punish us in some kind of way. He's teaching, this, teaching us this thing called trust. Amen. Just because you can't feel it don't mean he ain't watching. It doesn't mean he ain't pulling the strings behind the scenes. Amen. See, even in those moments of stillness and quiet, the Lord sometimes carries us the most. That, when, when, we're, when, when we feel like he's the farthest from us, that's when he's really doing the work and we don't even know about it. That's where we feel our peace. That's where we get our peace at. Of knowing, even when my flesh don't feel it, God is fighting for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we can rely on. See, David didn't have the book of Psalms to look back on and comfort himself. He was writing it and living it. But we have it. We know that even in the moments where we feel like God has deserted us, there's still this little thing that we can lean on called trust. Call faith, call faith, that, that know that even though things look catastrophic, I don't know how I'm going to make this out, Lord, I can trust in you. Amen. Going back to that situation I had on last week, when I, when I took a step back, right, when, when, when my tears kind of dried up a little bit, I said, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you're also my God. You, you fight for us even when we don't recognize it. You're the God that sits between the cherubims. 
You're the God of, of heaven's host and armies. Let me get out your way, God. Lord, fight for me. As only you can. Don't forget about, Lord, I need you to go fight for me. I got a phone call later that day. All is well. All is well. Something that could have could have been a mountain, right? That I could have just stressed and lost it behind. Worked out. Just like that. See, the enemy wants to deceive us to make us think God's not able. That he's forgotten about us. And God is saying, trust me, even when you can't see your way out, just lean not to your own understanding. Learn how to trust me. As we talked about in Sunday school, as we talked about in Sunday school, it's always going to come down to what our flesh wants and what our spirit wants. Our flesh is going to be ready to cry, give up, faint, say, God forgot about me. Our spirit is constant. It ain't going nowhere. It's just going to be like, you done crying now? <laughs> you done pouting? You done worrying and doubting? Okay, let, let, let's see God move now. Let's watch the hand of God move. Yeah. That's what the Spirit, the Spirit doesn't make any excuses. That's why if we walk by the Spirit, we can guarantee victory. But in our flesh, we've been to turn the house upside down, knocked out the kids, lost, you know, lost it. When all we had to do was just take a step, take a deep breath. Lord, you got it. God carries us, y'all. He carries us all much. He carries us like nobody will. When my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. We're relying on God, and guess what? He's dependable. David says, how, how long will you forgive me, Lord? Forever? Like, man, how long I got to go through this? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Right? I'm, I'm having a heart to heart with myself. I'm talking to myself every day, having sorrow in my heart. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Lord, I need you to consider and hear me. Oh, Lord, my God, lighten my eyes. Lest I take the long sleep, right? The sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. See, then people love to think that you're on your last leg. Oh, hey, dude, Amen. when you live for God and when you declare victory over your life, they, then people want to see you take a loss. Right, right. They want to see David saying, you see how my enemies are turning me. They waiting for me to lose it all. Right. Just says, God, don't forget about me. That's what, that's what we're relying on when we go through these pressures and these situations in life. We're, we're not relying on our flesh. No. We're not relying on ourselves. To get, we're not in control. Amen. Trust in the Lord. Learn how to get before the Lord's face and have that heart to heart. Trust, don't lean to your own understanding, but trust him with all of your heart. If there's one little thing that's keeping you from God and you're doing the other 99 things, that one thing will keep you from having victory. So you got to learn how to remove everything that will separate you from your master. That's what God wants. All he wants is some people that can trust him. He makes this thing very simple. Very simple. Amen. He says in verse 5, after I feel like the Lord has hid his face from me, after I'm having these heart-to-hearts with myself daily, sorrow is all over me, my enemies provoking me. He, he says, after all that, verse 5, but I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice. In your salvation. The best thing you can do when you're going through is learn how to have a rejoiceful spirit. Yeah. Learn how to have joy deep down on the inside. Lift holy hands. Get before God on your knees and pray. Pray. Sing songs of joy. Yeah. Call somebody and tell them, you know the Lord is good. But you're going through something. The Lord is still good and his mercy will do us forever. Amen. I can bask in the Lord's mercy. Yeah. Even when it don't seem right in my life, I, I don't have to get it all the time. Get it right all the time. I know I'm going to mess it up and jack it up. But God gets it right every single time. Every single time. When I jack it up, he'll be there waiting. Amen. He'll be there to fix and tweak all that silly stuff that we do and say, guess what? My mercy is right there. Trust in me. Trust, I didn't leave you. Trust. I said I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Trust in me. Put everything before the Lord. Amen. No matter how great or small it seems. Yeah. Throw it at his feet and walk away. 
then let him deal with it. Because we, we're getting to a point where we're driving ourselves crazy trying to fix and change stuff ourselves. It is never going to work. That's the point of having faith in God. Don't try to fix things else, it ain't gonna work. The women in our family, I'm sorry, it's one standing, standing sitting right there. <laughs> but the women on our family are, are hands-on type women. They like, they like to get out there and do some stuff. They ain't gonna wait for the man to come home and say, give me a few days out. They like to be in control and dictate some stuff. And that, that's just the thing for women. When women have been independent for so long, they just kind of pick that up. They ain't gonna wait on no wife and let we'll do it, all right. But sometimes, guess what? You gotta learn how to do this. <laughs> it ain't easy. Because we know, just let me do it, I can do it. And that's how we are with God. God, I, I see what the problem is, just let me do it. And God's like, no, sit down. Sit down, be quiet, don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. That, that's what we wrestle with. Trying to, trying to put our little sauce on it. Nope, God's like, I got this meal. Don't need your salt, don't need your pepper, don't need your paprika. Let me prepare this meal. We, our flesh wants to get the glory. Our flesh wants to say, I did it. Our flesh wants to, to say, I get the credit for this. So if we do it, how can God get the glory? This is what Joseph had to learn when he was sitting in that pit with no water. I had this dream. I had this coat of many colors. I had baby with my dad. I was a favorite child. And now that's gone. Now I'm in a pit with no water. See how fast life can happen? Yeah. See, we, we can't rely on our things. Flesh. Flesh. See, Joseph's success, man, hallelujah. Amen. Joseph's success was not going to come from him, be, him being his daddy's favorite child. That's flesh. His success was not going to come from him having on that coat of many colors that looked good to the eye. Flesh. His success was going to come from the spiritual thing that nobody else could see but him and God. And that was his dreams, his vision. That was the thing that couldn't be compromised. And that's what he had to learn. His success would not come through his father, but it would come on his own by his own faith. See, mama, daddy, granddaddy, grandmama can tell us about Jesus. They can help us along the way. But at some point, you know what we're going to have to do? Stand on our own two feet. We're going to have to figure it out on our own. That's what Joseph had to do. And that's where our success will come. Lord, I trust in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I know my safety is in you, Lord. I will sing unto the Lord. Even with tears in my eyes, I'll, I'll cry out a song of victory unto the Lord. Yeah. Why? Because he had dealt bountifully with me. I wake up and his mercies are new every day. He doesn't hold my feet to the fire because of what I did the day before. He don't remind me of what happened in 1982. He says, guess what? My mercies are new every day. Go ahead and get, get, the, get the withdrawal slip and write it down and go get it. Stop pouting. Stop fretting and fearing. Trust in me with all your heart. All we got to do is trust in him. Turn it, watch God turn it around. Isaiah 44. That's what we'll close at. Isaiah 44. Lord, don't get about me. Please, I need you, Lord. I don't know if anybody else needs you. <laughs> but I can testify. Lord, I need you with everything that's in me. Sometimes these messages hit, hit me in the, in the forehead and knock me, out, knock me out, you know? Sometimes it's just, sometimes we just teach you. And you may not have a second thought about it, you just encourage you. Sometimes you have to harken back to this teaching. And I'll be sitting there saying, I just told a congregation, he got to be God in the mountain and God in the valley. Now what I'm going to do, now I'm the one in the, in the valley. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to crawl back in church and say, well, y'all, I don't know. Uh, Y'all just pray for me. I don't know if I'm going to make it out. But no. Amen. He's God on the mountain, God in the valley. We're going to be all right. He'll work it out. Trust in the Lord, man. Have faith in God. Specifically be like God. Have a God kind of faith. Don't look at what you see. Don't look at the turmoil that's happening in the world because it's going to disheart you. 
Think about those things that are invisible. See, that's where your lifeline is. Yeah. The things we don't see. Yeah. Our, our spirit has all of these things that it offers to us, and we neglect it to fulfill our flesh. But our flesh is giving us rotten fruit. Stuff that's not going to help us grow and develop. It feels good, but it's not going to get us anywhere in this life. Amen. Our spirit produces all kind of righteousness. You know, doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Integrity. Yeah. Joy. Joy, joy is, is not based upon what's going on in my life. It's not based on if I'm in bereavement, if I just lost a loved one, if I lost my job, if the kids are cutting up. That's not what my joy, my joy is based, it's a spirit. It's based on the fact that God has freely given it to me. This is what Paul said when we talked about on Wednesday. God says, I don't want you to be corrupted in your thinking. I, I need you to know what God has freely given to you because you're in the kingdom of the Lord. When you've been freely given things, that means all we gotta do is accept it and walk in. So we, we, we lean to the flesh way too much. When all we got to do is trust in God and walk by the Spirit. What does that mean? That means I'm not looking at things from these two eyes right here. I'm looking at it through God's spiritual needs. That's good. That's good. Amen. Amen. In Isaiah 44, verse number one. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. Reminder, this is the same Lord that did what? Made them. You didn't make yourself. How you gonna take care of yourself? Did you come out of the womb with a bottle in your mouth saying, let me hold my bottle? Did you come out of the womb talking about, let me go get me some water from one? No, somebody had to hold you. Somebody had to give you milk. Somebody had to give you water. Somebody had to change your diaper so you wouldn't just have stuff all up in you, giving you bacteria and in infestations. I'm sorry, Sister Cassie, I know I missed that word. I don't know what the, the technical medical term is called for that. But you got to have somebody taking care of you. That's who we are. We can't do this on our own. We're, we're God's children. What parent don't want to be in that child's life and coddle them and cuddle them and change them and, and burp them and feed them? So why do we think God wants to be there for us? Amen. Why do we want to get, no, nah, I got it. Just like little children do. No, nah, let, me, let me get on the bike. You know you, don't, you need to get on the training wheels. No, nah, let me get on. I can, I'm ready. Get on the training wheels, son. No, nah, I want to get on the two wheels. Ball, bush your head. Oh, dad, why you let me get? This is how God, God has this problem with us all the time. Amen. Amen. God is constantly telling us, nope, don't do that. Pastor Clark gave a great illustration. See, God is, is, is merciful. He is long-suffering. He is patient. He don't slap the heck out of us just because we fall down and mess up. He gives us a chance to say, hey, don't do that. We, we do it. Excuse me. We do it again. God says, hey, I told you don't do it. Come on. We got it. Ah, I'm going to do it one more time, but I don't think it's that bad. Then when we hit rock bottom, now we say, well, Lord, just like the child with the training wheels. See, his commandments are not grievous. They're there to help us. Amen. Lift us up and carry. It's, it's, it's literally trying to understand why a child wants to constantly touch the electrical socket. Stop that. Don't do that. The child cannot compute why they can't touch the electrical socket. They don't know any better. Their brains cannot handle it. But what would we don't do that. They don't know any better. It's our job to keep them off that electrical socket. As they get older and they grow, guess what? They're going to know, oh, I'll never put my hand in no electrical socket. But while they're babies, they can't get it. So God has to be like, stop that. That's how we are. We, when we stay carnal, God has to come constantly baby us. Stop doing that. When we grow up, God can release us and say, oh, they got it. Go ahead, go, go ahead. I can trust you. But as long as we still playing with the socket and we're 40 years old, what do we want God to do? It's time for us to experience the greater things of God. This is part of it, practical application of the word. Not making it so 
um, as my dad, my dad would call it, abracadabra magic. That's what we do with the word. Sometimes we make it so crazy and, and super spiritual that we can't apply it to our everyday life. And Paul says, I, my, I hate for the fact that people have, have drawn you away. I fear that somebody's going to draw you away from the simplicity of the gospel. It's a simple application of the gospel. It's a, it has to be revealed. But how we live is, is real easy to understand. It's not that hard, y'all. We make it hard. But God has given us practical application of these things Amen. so that we can grow, so that we can develop, yeah. so that we can raise righteous seed and righteous children. That's, that's the purpose of the church and all these things. Not so that we can feel good to our flesh. It's okay to jump and shout and dance, but my goodness, learn something. <laughs> At least know what Psalm 23 says. Yes, At least know what John 3.16 says. My goodness. But that's the purpose of the church. Not to fulfill our flesh and to say, oh, I went to church, I had a good time. It's to look back and say, I'm elevating every day. I'm getting better and better. Amen. Getting better and better every day. That's what we want. I'm pleasing God more and more and more every day. That should be our goal as a church. God has chosen us. He's the one that made us and formed the wind from the womb. We remember what he told Jeremiah. As Pastor Clark would say, I don't have time to get into that. <laughs> That's a whole other another thing. But you, when we understand that God chose us before the foundation of the world, before there was ever a sun, moon, star, heaven, or earth, or angel in between, God already had us on his mind. He ordained to have a family. And he ordained for us to be in that family. When we understand that, we'll move different down here, y'all. We'll move different. People, people's opinion won't become as important to us. Yeah. Our values will change. Oh, yeah. okay. What's important change. It, we know who we are. Amen. We know why we were created. Mm -hmm. It says, Thus said the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. What does God say? Yeah. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, or Jeshurun in another place, which is a nickname for Jacob, whom I have chosen. Now this is it's such a slippery slope, man, because I love this part about God that he's chosen us. People that had not been chosen by God hate that part about God because they had not been chosen. <laughs> and I know it's, well, why would God choose you or why would God? He's God. Romans 9 tells it, you, you ain't nothing but clay. Can, can the clay say to the potter, why have you formed me like this? No. You, you didn't have no meaning with God where you could say, well, why you did this guy? Well, he's God. He can do what he wants. Amen. I don't have to understand why he chose me. I'm just happy he did. Yes, sir. I'm one of the people that know I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be born again. I know I'm here strictly on the fact that God chose me before the foundation of the world. Yes, That's the only reason I'm here. It didn't have nothing to do with my own efforts. Amen. And when we understand we've been chosen, we will understand we cannot fail. When we know we've been chosen, we cannot fail. Amen. Whatever you set your hand to do, God's going to prosper. Amen. He says, you don't have to fear, verse 3, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. And floods, where? Upon the dry we, Right now, we're dealing with some dry ground. It's been 100 degrees, about two weeks in a row. But God says, I'll, I'll, I'll put floods even on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. Who don't want that blessing? Who don't want your children's children to be blessed? Who would neglect so great a salvation? Who would reject that? God is saying, this is, don't be afraid. I know you think I've abandoned you. I know you're having a rough time, but guess what? This blessing, let me show you a guarantee. This blessing is not only for you, it's for your children after you. Yeah. Let me encourage you and lift you up, God says. Thanks. Don't be afraid. Don't be, I'm with you, and not only am I with you, I'm making a value that I'm going to be with your seed after you. Amen. That's what God does for us. We get older, that, that twilight, we can see it out there. We don't just have all these years laying up to just play around. We can closer and closer to meet our maker. Amen. That's why I say on Wednesday, 
I don't understand getting older and not maturing and not getting better and not just growing in life. I don't understand that. Yeah. I don't get it. Because as we get older, we should be getting happier, more joy. Yeah. We get to have our children and our grandchildren grow yeah. and, and we're able to affect people's lives and, yeah. and mentor people. Yes. That's the true joy. That's what that's what God is talking. This blessing is for us and the people after us. Amen. And we get to God allows us, He loves us so much, He allows us to have a part in it. Amen. Amen. He allows us to affect generations after that's us. Right. Amen. Just by serving Him and trusting Him. Amen. What a wonderful joy. That's a joy. That, that, that is a blessing from the Lord. Yes, it is. Who would have thought? He says. One shall say, oh, I'm sorry, verse 4, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses, that they being your offspring and your children. They're going to be not only as splendid as, as in spring up as the blades of grass that we see in the field, matter of fact, they're going to be like great trees or willows by the water courses. Mm -hmm. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God. These are the things that we have to encourage ourselves with when, so that we don't stumble when we go through dark places in life. The dry places of life are coming. We can't get around them. And this is what I mean by we be so super saintly and spiritual, we have no practical application of the word. We just want to shout hallelujah all day. And when trouble comes, we're not spiritually equipped because we've not trained ourselves with the word. We don't know what to do. That's good. That's good. No, trouble is going to come to your door. Amen. Tribulation is going to come to your door. Sometimes it's going to be self-inflicted. Sometimes it's going to be something you ain't have nothing to do with. It, but it's just going to be at your door. And you're going to have to deal with it. That's why Jesus said, even when you go through, be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. So God is with us. He's overcome for us. That's the good news. Good. Not that I'm living this, this life in the clouds where I don't know what's going on in my life. And I'm trying to put this, this fake facade out there like, oh, no, it's all good. No, the house burning down. The kids going crazy. My body breaking down. I need some help. We, we got to be real with ourselves. We want to put on this, yeah, yeah. this fake facade, put on our suit and say, oh, I'm doing good. Bless the holy favor. With everything around you tumbling down to the ground. Yeah, how, how is that going to help? How can our children got to be able to see us live this thing for real? That's right. Because as they get out of, out of our house, they're going to get to college. They're going to get to different places. Yeah, they're going right. to get the jobs. People are going to tell them you should be a Buddhist. Oh, wow. Amen. Oh, that's, oh, really? Oh, no, you should, you should be a Muslim. This way. Then you're going to have other people say, oh, you don't know what to believe. You should be agnostic. Then you're going to have the other person tell you, oh, no, you be, be an atheist. It ain't no God. Then you're going to have people tell you, you got it. You got it. They're going to have to know who Jesus is. Not a hoping and a wishing and a praying. By that time, it's going to be too late. We got to instill in them who Jesus is. That's why Paul says, these things I've written to you that you might know. Not have to guess and pray about. We got to know. And that comes through obedience to the Lord. That comes through walking with God. That comes through having a relationship where we consistently, consistently with God. Not putting on the Lord's coat when we go through things or when, when we want, when we have time. Consistently, consistently serving Him. Him being number one in everything. That's how we get our, our relationship with God right. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare. Who, who's going to set things in order for God? God who who God going to make an appointment with to help him? Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and the things that shall come, let them show unto them. Like, God is the one who ordained everything to be like it is. Amen. That beautiful sun that we get to see every single day since we've been little, we've seen it come up. The clouds and the rain that we get so we can have order. Right? The, the, the mountains that are so beautiful, the grass, the flowers, the sun, the moon, the stars, you and me, Amen. Every, the, the work 
works of our hands, the mental capacity that we have, God ordained all of it. So who God going to call when he in trouble? Who God going to call when he need help in his faith, Lord? He ain't got nobody to call. So he's the same yesterday, today, forevermore. He wants us to have that kind of attitude. He wants us to have that kind. That's where he's trying to get our faith level to. Where we're able to know God cannot fail. But when our flesh gets involved, you know, I'm like, Lord, you left me again. Lord, what am I going to do now? Lord, how is this going to work out? I remember being in the position where I said, well, Lord, I had a good run, but that's it. I done wiped it out now. It's over. And God says, my mercy is new. God says, I love you. Keep going. Yeah. It, that's what he, he's got. He's going to work it out. He just needs it for, for us to, he needs, he needs for it to click in our brain. Like it does for him. Fear ye not, verse 8, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? You know it ain't no God. I know not any. See, now we're going to get into the things of the world. See, the things of the world will try to leave, cause us to leave the things of the Bible and say, well, Everybody loves God. Everybody knows who God. God loves everybody. We can serve any God. Well, okay. I, you're, you're entitled to that opinion. Let's see. Verse 9 says, They that make a graven image are all of them empty. And their delectable things shall not profit. The things that tr people treasure so much, when they reject God and they reject certain things for God, that's the delectable things that God is talking about. He says they shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who has formed a God or a mortal or a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed and the workmen. They are men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear and they shall be ashamed together. This is what happens when we rely on false gods or on ourselves even. It leads to a point of shame. It leads to a point of no profitability. Just like the prophet says, it's going to come to nothing. The delectable things, the things that are so so great and that they treasure, that they cling to, he's saying it's going to be empty in the end. And that's what happens. When we reject God and we cling to the things that we think are so important in our lives, it leads us to nowhere. It has no profit for us. It, it literally it feels good to our flesh. But long term, it will destroy us. Amen. That's why we have to examine ourselves every day. Lord, is there something that I have a delectable thing? Is there is there a thing that I need to move out the way so that I can win? Is there an idol in my life that I've made that I love more than you? Flesh versus spirit. Flesh versus spirit. That, that sounds like a song. Flesh versus spirit. Flesh versus spirit. I was talking to Janetta yesterday and I forgot she asked me a Bible question I forgot what it was <laughs> because we always talk about different things but the the way for the most part when you're studying the word of God and you want to know the answer to something or you want to know if you're on the right track <clears throat> the best way that you'll know that 10 times out of 10 is does this appeal to my flesh or does this appeal to my spirit you can't go wrong. Does this appeal to my flesh? Am I getting the glory out of this? Does this glorify God and appeal to my spirit? See, the church is now trying to live a fleshly game and still glorify God at the same time. How much time am I? Where, where am I at, bro, Jason? Um, 44, 30. 40 minutes? 44 minutes. 44, oh, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, 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 it's, it's okay. Take your time. Take your time. Okay, you called me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Sister Cassie. Thank you, Sister Christine. But our flesh, it, the problem, especially in the world, we understand that, but it's a problem in the church when our flesh begins to override the spirit. We, we do things that play the part or look the part, but aren't from God. 
but we want the blessing of God. So we do all these things in church, and we expect the blessing from God, and then when it don't come, we say, see, I knew God was real. I knew God forgot about me. Again, did we seek him with our flesh or with our spirit? One of the things that, that's wild to me is how the world is waiting to see the mark of the beast. You hear it all the time. People make jokes about 666. Mark of the beast. Don't get that chip in your arm. Right? You, am I tripping or have y'all heard that before? You hear it all the time. This is what I want us to know. You can be the worst sinner in the world and say, well, I'm not getting no chip in my arm. Do you think that's going to make you born again? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can live for God and be righteous and have righteousness on your back and get a chip. Is that going to take away your righteousness that Jesus has given you? Fleshly. Fleshly. Again, we're, because we're not spiritual, we're seeking how to gratify God or please God in our flesh. So the mark, that, and, and I know this, I didn't got, Sister Charlotte, I didn't got way off, off topic. But as Cassie said, she called in for this, so I'm going I'm to I'm keep going just a little longer. Is that okay with y'all? Amen. Okay. Because this is important. I don't talk about this as, as much, but this is important because it's, it puts fear in people's hearts. People are looking for something that doesn't even exist. Something that ain't even coming. That's not even coming. The mark of the beast, trust me, the way we've been taught it is not, you'll never see it. It's not coming. Nobody's going to come try to brand your hand or put a computer chip right. on, on your, your leg. It's never going to happen. That's just done so people can put fear in people's hearts. The mark of the beast is a spiritual mark. Yes. That's like, just like in the book of Revelation, it says that God's name is written in our foreheads. God's name ain't literally written in our foreheads, but we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. God's mark and DNA is all over us because we've been born again. Amen. So the mark of the beast just simply means it implies the mark that the devil makes on an unbeliever's life. It's just like if you're watching basketball and LeBron James is playing. See, it's a LeBron example for everything. No matter what y'all say, Junior. Junior, I can't use Michael Jordan for this example because it wouldn't work. But it's a LeBron example, bro. Mark is for everything. If you're watching, if you, I'm sorry, let me, let me use the Cowboys, let me use the Cowboys and the Saints. Is that no. right? If you're watching football, somebody might say, well, well man, uh, Michael Parsons is making his mark on the game. We can feel Michael Parsons' imprint on this game. That don't mean Michael Parsons out there with a black marker marking up stuff. That means his impact, his mark is on the game. Mark of the beast speaks to the mark that's put on the life of the world by, uh, by the devil. Don't you look out into the world now and see what the devil is doing? Yeah. That's the mark of the beast. Yeah. But our name, God's name, is written in our foreheads. That's why Paul says, one thing this was certain, the Lord knows the hand. There he is. Yeah. So people are, people are trying to fleshly, so I can't get the mark. We want to live this unholy life that don't, doesn't please God. And then we want to say, but I can't get the mark. I can't get the chip. No, it's not how this works. We got to have a mark of having God in our life. That's how we're saved. And the scripture says it was the devil that deceived them. How did he deceive them? Through the flesh. Through the seeking flesh, not spirit. Seeking flesh. Anyway, let me finish the show. Five minutes, and I'm, I'm, I'm not be done. I promise. Let's, matter of fact, let me just skip to verse. Let's skip down to 21, and I'll be done. And read these last couple of verses. When we feel like the Lord has forgotten about us, or we're going through things, or we feel like God has abandoned us, because whether we're going through it now, or we're going through it in the future, it's gonna be some 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 times, some rough times. But the good news is that don't mean we gotta fret or fear. We can trust in God that we have the victory. Amen. Verse 21 says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel. For you are my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art you, we belong to God. You're my servant, O Israel. You shall not be forgotten. Oh, Lord, I feel like you forgot about. He says, No. 
You shall not be forgotten to me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions and as a cloud your sins. Come back to me. Return unto me. Why? I've redeemed thee. You've been bought and paid for with a price. Y'all got me sweating today. <laughs> so it's just remember God is in another place he tells us God basically stands out in the marketplace just piping playing music calling saying come to me and people say they have something better than you so Jesus says well no go out to the highway go out to the places where, where, where the, get, get all the people that they don't want to come in here and bring them in that's what God is after to say. If you think you deserve to be saved, you can't be saved. That's by the grace of God. Not a worse list any man should boast. We're here by God's grace. I tell my testimony all the time. I could have died at 25 and been in hell. And there was a lot more better 25-year-olds than me. So I didn't deserve to hit 30 and be saved. I'm here by the grace and mercy of God. So I can't boast them. Other people might can boast. They might have lived a life that, that was worthy of being saved. I didn't. I'm here by his grace and mercy. So that's what I teach. The grace and mercy of God. The fact that God called out to us before the foundation of the world and dragged us into salvation. That's what Peter said. It's just like when you get the net and you drag those fishes onto the boat. That's what God had to do with it. We was in the water. We wouldn't come. He had to dip that net down there and drag us into salvation. Amen. Verse 23, sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth in the singing. Again, if we can't have joy in a song on our lips when we think about the goodness of the Lord, even in adversity, we can still break forth in the singing. Guess what? If we don't want to do it, ye mountains. Let the mountains do it. Oh, forest and every tree therein. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. See, God gets the glory when we're obeying him. God gets the glory when we're doing what his word says. Thus says the Lord, your redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Notice how the prophet keeps taking it back to give God the glory. That it has nothing to do with us. This was God that did this before the foundation of the world. Before you was in your, your mama's stomach. Mm -hmm. He had already did this thing. Mm -hmm. He says, I am the Lord that maketh all things. That stretch forth the heavens alone. That spread abroad the earth. How does he do it? By himself. He needs no help. Mm -hmm. That frustrated the tokens of the lives. That makes divine. Uh, what's that word? Diviners, different. <laughs> that makes them people mad. You know, the people that, that do that stuff and that trickery and sorcery. That turns wise men back. He makes their knowledge look foolish. Last verse. That confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers. That says to Jerusalem, guess what? You're going to be inhabited right now, even though I make you desolate for a time. Even though in my anger I, I said I'm gonna cut you off, I'm not gonna, my anger not gonna last forever. Guess what, Jerusalem? You're gonna be inhabited. Mm -hmm. To the seas of Judah, you shall be built again. And I will raise up the decayed places. I haven't forgotten about you. All God said is seek me with all your heart. Seek me with all of your mind. Your soul. Every, seek to please God. say, let me go meet with God's people today. Amen. Our flesh is not going to want to lift holy hands and praise God and sing songs and break forth in the dance. Our flesh is not going to want to do it all the time. But we're not relying on our flesh. We're relying upon the Holy Ghost. Relying upon the Spirit of God. And when we take ourselves out of the equation, we're bound to have good success. We're bound to just take off in life. When we die to ourselves. And again, this thing is done daily. We die daily so that we can win Christ. 